It's The Real News and I'm Sharmini Pires and welcome back to segment two of my conversation with Dr. Ali Fatola Najad. He's an independent scholar based in Doha and Berlin with a focus on Iran, West Asia and North Africa. He's a visiting fellow at the Brookings Doha Center. Welcome back, Ali. Thank you. Ali, by withdrawing from the JCPOA, Iran's nuclear deal. The U.S. is carrying out an aggressive economic warfare against Iran so that it sparks an economic crisis that will eventually lead to regime change or war with Iran. And with the existing alliance of Israel, Saudi Arabia and the U.S., all this leads to a toxic combination for Iran. So uh, in part one, uh, you mentioned the authoritarian state's control of the economy. Explain why that is so debilitating for the domestic economy, particularly given what you mentioned in part one, which is these state apparatuses uh, and institutions that have such a grip on the Iranian economy. Well, as I've mentioned um, in the first sec uh, segment, uh, the Iran's economy is basically dominated uh, by uh, semi-state and state entities, and where th the private sector is very marginalized. And those semi-state and state entities have both political and economic power. And those are the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, uh, basically, uh, the military that is uh, omnipresent in all economic sectors, in all strategic economic sectors. Then you have uh, the religious foundations uh, that are basically acting as economic conglomerates and that are also quite heavily present in uh, very important sections. And um, you have other, uh, you know, state-related uh, uh, entities uh, who are uh, in the economic field. So the problem is that you don't have really a free entrepreneurship uh, that is uh, present in Iran and that can, you know, uh, that can uh, be integrated in the uh, economy and get involved there because of the dominance uh, of the earlier mentioned entities. So this is a very deep structural problem that the Islamic Republic has faced from the very beginning. And this continues until today. And so the kind of policies that the state has uh, employed has, of course, been some kind of um, populism uh, in terms of, uh, you know, providing some uh, social securities. So, Ali, essentially you're saying that these uh, state agencies and apparatus has a huge grip on the economy. That could not be a bad thing if the policies of these agencies are actually stimulating the economy, generating a productive economy for the citizens of the country. Um, but your main argument here is that it isn't stimulating the private sector, it isn't stimulating entrepreneurship. Um, dig a little further into that. What do you exactly mean by it? Absolutely. I mean, in theory, this shouldn't be uh, a very bad thing if the state uh, and those state entities would engage in some kind of a, um, you know, sustainable development projects, uh, unemployment, uh, employment projects. But in the Iranian case, given uh, the um, intimate connection between political and economic power, what we have seen are high levels of corruption, uh, mismanagement, uh, and projects that are largely to the benefit of those actors alone. So uh, there are in, you know, numerous cases uh, where um, you wouldn't see actually uh, many of those projects being beneficial to wider sections of society. And, uh, for example, take uh, the issue of the environmental protests that is, you know, that are going on in Iran for quite some time. Uh, many of them uh, have been a result of the mismanagement and the construction of dams and other construction projects led by the IRGC. 
And because in many cases, uh, not only they don't make much of economic sense, but uh, they have also a lot of social and environmental costs. So what is happening, what was happening with those protesters and activists, that many of them have been detained. And so there has been huge repression. So on this particular example, you see the, the intimate relationship between the economic and the political sphere, when both spheres are controlled by one single entity. And um, if you look at the scholarly literature, you see that although uh, during the Shah era, the pre-revolutionary era, um, the issue of uh, the divisions of classes and social inequality have been very strong and, on, and uh, with no doubt one of the main drivers uh, of the revolution against the Shah. But the political economy, the social inequality has not really changed uh, after the revolution. And this has led by now to a lot of social frustration uh, you see, uh, you know, high rates of uh, social inequality. You have uh, basically half of the Iranian population living around the poverty line. Uh, and this is quite uh, startling, given the fact that Iran has one of the world's largest oil and gas reserves. So it's objectively one of the richest countries on Earth. But the problem is that this wealth is not distributed equally. And... Um, you have a uh, very large uh, portion of the uh, Iranian population living in slums, uh, 15 million, according to some estimates. You have very high uh, youth unemployment, one of the highest worldwide, uh, almost 40%. And many of the socioeconomic indicators that are quite uh, similar to all those countries who have experienced the Arab Spring in 2011. So this is a structural problem that is intimately related to a political elite that also monopolizes economic power. Many, so in addition to that, we've seen um, capital flight uh, over uh, you know, the Ahmadinejad government's era, but also this administration's uh, period, um, hundreds uh, of billion of dollars of capital flight you have many of the elite's families having very large sums uh, outside the country, basically. And all of this, uh, you know, uh, cannot be employed inside uh, of the country, if, even if good economic policies were implemented. So um, you have this peculiar Iranian combination of monopolistic capitalist entities plus gov uh, those entities being uh, uh, dominated and by the semi-state and state entities that we've mentioned, plus neoliberal leaning administrations of the last two decades who did not really uh, you know, pay attention to those class divides and social inequality that were plaguing Iranian society for quite some time. And as a result of this political and social misery, we've seen those unprecedented uh, protests and this uprising at the turn of the year. And we still see the continuation of protests because of various issues, not only the very real uh, you know, environmental problems. Iran is facing an unprecedented environmental catastrophe with uh, much of the country being inhabitable in only 15 to 20 years from now and thus undermining the very livelihoods of tens of millions of Iranians. Not only the environmental issue is driving protests, but also you know, other social and political issues. So whenever you, s you see the protests in Iran uh, that have continued ever since, as I, sa say, as I said, uh, you see that many of the grievances may not be political at the beginning, but as soon as people take to the streets, you always um, hear quite uh, clear anti-regime protests. Uh, and all of this shows you that on multiple levels, there are, uh, you know, a lot of frustrations, but um, people are cognizant of the fact that it is, it has something to do with the very political structure of the country that, is, that does not allow for economic development that is to the benefit of larger sections of society. And it also doesn't allow 
for uh, political participation for the bulk of society that is excluded from the political process. And uh, this kind of participation would be also a meaningful way to have, uh, you know, to have a good development in Iran. So there is a lot, lot of blockades um, economically and politically. Um, against this backdrop, there is huge frustration. All right, Ali, I'm going to take this into a third segment because in that third segment, I want to discuss with you, um, given the constraints of uh, the uh, Iranian state and given the constraints of this sort of authoritarian elements uh, and the ruling elite that controls the economy of Iran, um, this is these protests that are taking place, whether they are political, economic, uh, about inequality, they are certainly a wake-up call to the states. And if they're not doing anything about it, it's only going to get worse. So uh, let's discuss that in the next segment. I thank you for joining us for now, Ali.